Hey, it's the Arvin and Mike show. He's an education investor and I'm an education entrepreneur. We are both dads to two kids. He's a Carolina Tar Heel with Indian parents, whereas I am a Duke Blue Devil with Jewish parents, all of which meaning there are four retirees out there disappointed that neither of us became doctors. Arvin, you blogged this speech where you become the, the fictional president of Yale University, which I love. Is it a good look for me? I think it's good because it sets the bar high. You're not like proposing that you're the president of like state U. Yeah. You're going all the way to the top. So I love it. Have you ever been to Yale? <laughs> spent, spent way too much time there. When did you graduate from Yale? 2009. Okay, got it. All right. So it was already woke, but it wasn't like they were punching people if they were mildly conservative yet. That's right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you as Yale president, you're saying, okay, $300,000 for four years of college is expensive. It's too expensive. Yeah. And that's where you're beginning or the president saying our college is too expensive. Who listens to a speech from a university president anyways? The only way to get your audience's attention is to be deliberately provocative. So I wanted to really push the button right from the start and say Yale is overpriced. Okay, how are you gonna cut the cost side of Yale? Are you firing people or are you doing something else? I don't think you need to fire people because I think actually, what's the purpose of an endowment? It's an endowment, you know, there's what, $30 billion in Yale's endowment. The purpose of that is to help fund the educational program of the school. And yet there's this false belief that the endowment only goes one direction and that's up. Uh, I think instead we can start to use your endowment to possibly support, you know, any potential losses. And I don't think there would be significant losses because you have two things at your disposal. One is you have the actual fundraising. No one's saying we stop that. You can still, you know, the, the, the alumni network of Yale continue to give generously and you always have the people trying to get their kids into Yale that will donate generously. And then you also have the returns that that endowment's generating in the market every year. And that's a sign when, when you're investing $30 billion, that's a significant sum each year that you can invest. So I think actually you wouldn't have to cut costs. You wouldn't have to lay people off. You would just be able to, to cover this, but with your existing programs. Okay. Guys, you're taking some endowment and you're saying, we're not just spending the interest on the endowment like we've always done. We're opening the door to actually subtract endowment. We're gonna use that cash to cross subsidize. We already give full rides to the kids whose families earn $100,000 or less, which are very few of our students, but we give them full rides. And we can cover a lot more people, like families up to 250K of combined family income. Everything's free. And so our sort of tuition side, our tuition revenue is going to go down, but we're making that up just by spending down the endowment a little faster. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the reason I focus on sticker price is because I think, I think a lot of poorer families aren't even aware of how generous the scholarship opportunities are. And so it could be discouraging and actually probably disincentivize even applications. Yes. Yeah, it is interesting. You're right. Because the, which we've, we've talked about separately, you and I, but like all the colleges charge the same amount, right? Yale charges the same as Colby, charges the same as Dartmouth, charges the same as like, you know, a tiny private college you've never heard of. They all roughly charge the same amounts. Yeah. And so families only hear this scary story. And yet the truth is for, you know, with financial aid, the true amount families are paying varies enormously and they're only hearing the top price and it has nothing to do with the price they would actually pay whether the subsidy is coming just from the feds yep. through their Pell Grants or you know subsidies through the college itself like Yale. And it is interesting because you're right. If Yale dropped from 70 grand all in to 35 grand all in, just that message alone might get them on the radar screen of a lot of families who they wouldn't even paying the 35 grand. They're still going to pay zero, but they would just hear about it in the news that there is a college that's great yeah. that charges a lot less. But these, you know, you, you can't get there because the colleges, you know, behave in a cluster. Yeah. 
Slight tangent, but don't you think in the age of personalized ads, like I look at and I see these ads and they could not be more personalized. I'll see a a, a person wearing a, a shirt about a Michigan person yes. living in North Carolina and I'm like, how is it so personalized? Yes. Why can't we have a personalized ad where people are seeing Yale is free and for everyone who earns less than 200 grand, that's what they know Yale is. Yes. That's brilliant. I don't know. I assume they're going in that direction. And some of it is maybe they're a little sleepier at the wheel than the companies selling the actual Michigan sweatshirts that are probably pretty elite at SEO. Yeah. They'll get there. You're right. That's actually a great, great point. But as as the Yale president, I guess, I one of the reasons they that all the colleges say, here's why we don't spend down the endowment. Once we open that door, there are unlimited demands from our students and faculty that will spend us into Venezuela land in seconds. We'll spend all 30 billion in like five (laughs) minutes and there'll be protests. Why aren't you, why aren't you paying like the cafeteria workers $80,000 a year? Don't they deserve a fair wage? There are a million different ways to spend money. Why are you opening this Pandora's box? Your response, Mr. President. Never let perfect be the enemy of good. (laughs) <laughs> it's such it's a silly argument to say let's spend less because by spending a little more people will ask us to spend even more i mean if it, anyone who's convinced by that argument we have some fundamental philosophical disagreements i we you and i might have some because even now it's sort of like i do think that there's a lot of evidence that human behavior is like that that People don't think of things in a, a, you know, sort of continuous function where you're sort of saying, hey, logically, there's an arbitrary cap. And I'm just saying arbitrary cap plus 2% of additional spend. Why would that open the Pandora's box? But I, I do think there's a lot of evidence that people don't think of it that way. It almost releases part of you to be like, there's a yeah. free money tree. Any restrictions on the expenditure of that free money tree are unfair. Yeah, but Mike, but we're talking about an elite higher educational institution and education should be able to allow people, increase people's uh, ability to rationally discuss ideas and come to logical conclusions and overcome potentially their inherent biases and flaws. So if you're telling me Yale can't potentially help inform a, a their audience of the sophistication in their plan, if you're asking them to essentially dumb it down, they can't open this box because it'll open forever. That's a really, really pessimistic view of humanity's overall prospects. Because where where are we headed if we're not able, mm. to, if, if Yale can't, if Yale can't push the boundaries a little bit and get some understanding for that within their community, what hope did the rest of us have? I think a couple things. One, There's a lot of people who would hear you say that who would say it's precisely Yale that can't have an adult conversation. They're literally the worst right now at having it. And there's a whole, you know, project, the Heterodox Academy, which is sort of describing how college campuses across the country are unable to rationally debate. And there's this kind of woke religion that's trampling sort of any reasonable discussion, blah, blah, blah. But at least in that argument, the more elite the institution the least capable it is to have a a, you know sort of rational discussion so that's sort of like i guess you by saying that you don't buy that at all in other words your experience is that not that the yale people are a bunch of eggheads and kind of crazies your experience is no 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 they're really super like thoughtful rational no no what what where i agree with that argument is that elite institutions currently positioned are the least likely to try and entertain that. So they're the least like they're more likely to just let the woke religion trample them. That doesn't mean that so I am asking for a very unlikely form of leadership, but I do think that form of leadership can be effective. So there's a difference between whether or not it's likely and whether or not when done it can be effective. Mm, mm, fair. Fair. You have a thread the needle. I get it, right? That like you can see the path. Yes. And it might not be easy, but you can yes. imagine getting to the other side. That's that's good. Hey, you had another idea as fake Yale president, and you wanted to spend three billion dollars. Yeah. Investing in other universities. Could you give an example of what an investment like might look like under that banner? Yeah. So I think of it kind of like an income share agreement 
at the college level. So Yale invests, let's call it $50 million over five years in Colby College and some new initiatives happening there. And in exchange for that investment, which comes with technical assistance from Yale in terms of setting up potentially new labs and new hiring structures, things that they have the resources and know-how, as well as affiliation with the name of Yale, which obviously can't hurt. And with that investment, the goal is Colby can fortify its own positioning, its own kind of precarious stance within a rapidly evolving higher education world. And hopefully they, you know, they're so worried about the risk of disappearing or, you know, going bankrupt that taking this investment and trading a share of future income is worth it to fortify the fact that they can have that pie and they can have that pie continue to grow for the coming years. Do they want to be one of the survivors or do they want to be one of the the walking dead as an institution? Yeah, that's pretty interesting. It makes me think of a couple things. One, the elite colleges, including Yale, sometimes essentially do that with universities yeah. abroad, right? And they say, we've got some know-how, we've got some good people, we'll send them to you for a year. You can brand with us. In exchange, we'll take a royalty of X percent of whatever yep. you're taking in. And yep. there's that idea. And the second thing, Arvin, it makes me think of is the way hospitals are working, where the little ones are essentially being like threatened economically, just like small non-branded colleges or lower branded colleges. Obviously, Col- Colby has a strong brand. It's not Yale's, but it's strong. But and so, you know, a big, big hospital in Boston, like Mass General, might scoop up a bunch of regional hospitals around New England. And so they form some type of partnership where they can leverage the brand and expertise in different ways of the flagship institution. And so it could be that a world emerges where there's Yale and a whole bunch of Yale Yale partner colleges sort of competing against Harvard and a whole bunch of Harvard partner colleges. It would be interesting. Is that part of what you foresee and, and what you mean in terms of that investment opportunity? Exactly. Some sort of snowball effect with incremental investment coming into this sector, because I think for Yale... Yale doesn't want to be the last higher education, you know, one of the last five higher education institutions surviving. They want a thriving higher education space. So they have to think, they have to be responsible stewards of the entire sector, given their prominent position. And that means taking some more risks and doing more that may not have the most immediate tangible payoff, but has more promise for the long run. Okay, I want to get to another idea you have as the fake Yale president, which is not only a billion towards loan forgiveness of Yale students, but a billion for loan forgiveness of kids who attended other colleges, like which would freak out probably the board of trustees and maybe some greedy students who are like, no, 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 we should get all of the Yale forgiveness. Don't spread it around, Mr. President. What What's your thought there? I think it's the right decision if you want to create the kind of the kind of snowball effects that could really disrupt the sector and how we view student debt, you know, because right now student debt kind of feels intractable. And the only way to start to make it tractable is for those in the highest positions of power in higher education start to take some bolder steps. And this is just an example of like what would be a bold step that might potentially have some ripple effects. How would you like, who would you give the billion of like, if there's X trillion of, you know, student debt in the US, how would you pick the lucky few to get your loan forgiveness? Like, would it be a lottery? Yeah. Would you make it a reality show? Yes. Like, in other words, it's like, because you're talking about such big payoffs, like what's what happens on the show? Like, I get what the final part is, is like, oh my God, I just won. We could literally create an entire TikTok series around each, you know, each day someone's just getting their loan and, you know, you just create a, you you build popular demand just from the ground up. Interesting. You could create an entire strategy with this, with this kind of money. It's like Oprah giving away cars was, you know, was a seminal moment for a week. And that was to like, what, 200 people. So I think we could, we could do something pretty big. Yeah, you know, you know, that's cool. The other thing is like, if you have free money to give away the, you know, like social media captures a lot of good deeds, Yeah. right? Like person does interesting good deed, right? So you could just trail that what the internet is sort of churning out anyway, and then just call up the person and be like, you have any student debt? And they're like, yeah, I got, you know, $16,000 in loans from 10 years ago. You're like, paid off from Yale, baby. And so, yeah, 
Well, let me tell you this. I mean, my whole my whole big picture of why I'm giving this speech as the fake president of Yale is because I'm really, really worried about income share agreements and what they potentially mean for higher education. The normal way to pay for college is you borrow money yeah. from a bank. And the income share agreement is you promise your fu- some percentage of your future earnings. So in each case, you're making a promise. One time you say, hey, I'm going to borrow $50,000 from you and I'll pay you back 60000 later. And that's it. That's what everybody does. An ISA, an income share agreement says, yeah, I'm still, quote unquote, borrowing 50000 like for my tuition, but I'm going to pay you back once I'm earning 70000 a year. I'm going to give you, let's say, 10% of my earnings each year until you've gotten your full $60,000 back or something like that, right? So- yeah, and and so people really love this idea because it's a the, the debt promise. There's very rare circumstances where your debt can be forgiven. It's it, almost always you're on the hook for that promise. Whereas in it, right, whether you get a good job or you don't, you got to start paying back. Exactly. Whereas in this promise, it depends if you choose not to not to work. If you do for some reason don't get a job that's with the right earning potential, you're not on the hook for that promise. That promise is that you're essentially forgiven. And pe- so people really like that. Right. And so, you know, like Purdue University, well-known college in the Midwest has started doing that where they say, hey, look, maybe you can do one of these agreements instead of a conventional borrow money. You sign off a percentage of your future income. And obviously, as you know, it's pretty popular with these coding boot camps that train you really quickly so you can get a job as a web designer or something else as a programmer. Yeah. So I remember you saying you like one thing about ISAs and you do not like another thing about ISAs. Yeah, I like ISAs because they seem to be in some way tackling this issue of saying college is overpriced relative to what they give you. So it's it's, it's a way of saying somehow, you know, that, that we need to align incentives better. I like that. I like that they're trying to create some sort of disruption to make higher education more affordable or... Yep, got it. Yep. But what I don't like is... Whenever Silicon Valley gets into doing something, they just want to take over the world. So it's not like, you know, Facebook doesn't want to create a social network that can allow people to share some photos. They want to literally be on everyone's phone 100% of their day. Yeah. They just have this world dominance mentality. And if ISAs start to become the norm and if that becomes this dominant method of how we pay for college or how we pay how we think about higher education I think it's really dangerous because there's something so valuable about higher education that's not linked to the job you get so I think a great education a job is a very nice outcome but it's not the purpose of why I got the education yeah, I think so. I'm sort of half with you, half not. So I, one thing I really liked about um, President Obama's education efforts when it comes to higher ed is he was trying to make colleges become more transparent yeah. about their outcomes. And so what a lot of kids than adults, right? Like, you know, 18 year olds when they're coming in and 22 going out or adult learners, people of all types, frequently they would go to the college pay all the money to the college. The college has 100% of its money, yeah. the people from the bank, essentially. The bank is owed the debt and the person fails to get anywhere near a good job. Yeah. The colleges hated Obama's plans and they did everything they could to resist making transparent what insiders knew, that there were a whole bunch of people who study at these colleges who diligently do all the work, graduate and find themselves unemployable and end up working at Starbucks, which they could have done without a college. This makes people very angry and frustrated. But from the college's point of view, as you said earlier, five minutes earlier, like a lot of colleges are in trouble. So in other words, despite this lack of transparency to their customers, they're struggling to make it. So when Obama says, be more transparent, even if it means some of your customers will then not go to your college, the colleges respond, but that could put some of us over the edge. Yeah. We might go bankrupt. So I feel like the big problem as it exists is transparency. And where the colleges kind of fuzz the issue somewhat is they keep saying, but we're not about trying to help you get a job. 
we're about trying this this yeah. non falsifiable claim of like we're trying to make you like a better thinker, yeah, a critical thinker, and we don't have necessarily any evidence that we're doing it, but that's the whole point of a liberal arts education. And if you try to measure it too carefully, if we are doing that, you'll mess up the liberal arts education. So you just got to trust us we're doing that. And by the way, if you end up at Starbucks, it's not our fault. So I think the ISAs move things like like it's so against the customer yeah. right now yes the student i think it moves it a lot in their direction so that's why i i favor generally the ideas of a- isas but how do you stop it from going too far because don't you think there is a too far yes but it's interesting because i asked you a version of the two like we both are hitting each other with slippery slope issues right <laughs> yeah you earlier said wait wait rule number one of this podcast no using my words against me. <laughs> I'm using my own words against me, right? I critiqued you because I'm like, look, yeah. honestly, once you start giving away some of the endowment, it ain't going to be one billion because once all the demands are made, it'll all be gone like very quickly. Um, and you won't be able to hold back the, the forces at bay. So the flip of that you're putting on me, which is like, hey, if you start and you start by allowing 5% of degrees to be financed by income share agreements. And oh, by the way, there are companies that could like run the back end of these income share agreements that would push it to grow much faster. How would you stop the capitalist tendency to essentially destroy the liberal arts thing and get rid of all the liberal arts majors that aren't associated with good jobs? Like, won't poetry majors go away because everybody's going to become aware that a lot of poetry majors, well, they certainly don't get jobs out of their poetry major. They might get jobs for other reasons. They were really talented kids yeah. separate from the poetry major, right? So you're worried about that coming out. And I think that's a fair point. Like things could go, you know, eventually the other direction. The only thing is, I think, you know, it gets complicated, but to some extent, people that are issuing debt, traditional debt, are probably open if it becomes a normal product to issuing yeah. ISAs, right? Like, in other words, if you're one of the big institutions that handles student loans, it stands to reason that a different product would be we also handle yeah. student ISAs. Like if this yeah. actually got popular, I don't I don't I think it would just be more choices for the person on how to finance themselves. Yeah. So so I think where you've convinced me is I'm very happy for the ISA trend to continue. I guess I would say it it would be awesome to see more ISAs available to students as a choice. At the same time, I would love some sort of countervailing transparency. Yeah. Look, in higher ed, there's a very strong bully pulpit for the big name colleges like Yale. So I love that you want to use it for something besides you know, yeah. Yale. Um, that might block you from getting hired during the interview <laughs> process. You might get beat out by your clone who's just all about how... Yale will move up three spots past Princeton and Harvard to reclaim number one in U.S. News and World Report. Like that person might actually win the job, but I like I'd like to see you have the job. Well, that, that's maybe I'll have to settle for some second rate institution like Duke. Do you think I can put push the strategy yeah, there? There you go. <laughs> yeah, no, there they would hire you in a second. They, they got <laughs> nobody. So I want to talk about your own experience with ISAs. I read your own piece on Spazato, and I want to hear more what worked and what didn't? Sure. Uh, We created a tiny, tiny graduate school of education in Boston. It's named after a guy who was a Massachusetts teacher of the year and became the principal of our charter school. His name's Charlie Spizzato. So our school's called the Spizzato Graduate School of Education. And, you know, because it's a tiny school and we're trying to do some innovative stuff, we, you know, created an interesting approach to financing it, which involves a version of the income share agreement. So what we said to these 22-year-old um, recent college grads who are considering us to be their masters in teaching program, we said, listen, you join us, you don't take any conventional loan. Here's how you'll pay us back. One, we're going to make you so good that really good charter schools will recognize how good you are as a rookie teacher. And they'll pay us, they'll pay our grad school for the right to hire you. So we think we can get, you know, seven, $8,000 each time one of you finishes our program and takes a job. 
we think there's going to be a feeding frenzy of recruiters who want you and they're, they're willing to pay us because they'll feel the values and training are aligned with what they're doing in their school. So that's one way we would get paid back. How are you so confident about that, if I may ask? We knew that charters get, there's an interesting sort of puzzle Typical charter lead would say, I have hundreds of applications and yet I can't easily find teachers that are aligned with us. And you're like, oh, what do you mean? And so they would say, well, everybody says they have high expectations for all kids, but when you drill down and you really want people that will do a whole bunch of practices to actually really raise student achievement and sort of have the work ethic that it's worthwhile to put in, you know, nights and weekends in order to help kids like reach those goals. And you're going to call some parents and you're going to help a lot of kids after school, all these different things. You're going to look at the data, blah, blah, blah. We find that we have all these applicants, but they don't really want to sign up for a school like ours. And it's hard for us in the hiring process to figure out who's the right people. So if only there were a place that we knew had the values that we have, in fact, maybe used our best teachers to actually teach those graduate student classes, then we wouldn't be retraining people when they joined us. They would already kind of have our DNA. And so that's why we knew there was demand on the employer side. So uh, keep keep going. So where's the rest of the money coming from? So the other, the income share agreement goes to the same thing. We're really confident that people would really want these graduates. So we said to the students, listen, you got to pay us back um, a total of $10,000. But the way we'll do it is we guarantee that you'll get a teaching job, which nowadays you know, these vary, but let's say it pays about $50,000 a year. So you'll get a job that pays around $50,000 a year. And the first year you have that job, you'll give us $5,000 of your salary. And the second year you have that job, you'll give us $5,000 of that salary. So that's 10,000. That's it. Like in our case, there was no interest or anything like that. It's just like, you've now paid us back. Thank you. We add that 10,000 to maybe the 7,000 we got as a finder's fee, for lack of a better word. And that was our $17,000 of revenue. And we did a little philanthropy on top of that, maybe three or $4,000 per student. So we could get to something like 20,000 per student is what we could spend on their education. And how has it worked? It's worked great. Like we've collected almost every single dollar, like, cause you know, it's an income share agreement in that if you don't succeed in getting a job, but you, you know, you try essentially, uh, like you don't owe the money. Um, So from the point of view of the student, what we're doing is taking away the risk. What if I go through this program, I do a good job, and I can't get hired as a teacher? What happens? Uh, And it takes away the stress of taking on debt. They're not actually borrowing money that they have to pay back, irrespective of whether they get a teaching job. And the time horizon is pretty tight. It's like two years, right? So they're, they're free and clear after two years, whereas I met Peru in 1999 and we are still paying off five different medical school loans that she has here in the year 2021 so you know a lot of loans have a long time horizon and uh these income share agreements can be structured so they don't like pay us back with your early money we'll be really focused on helping you get a good job that you like and then we'll be out of there honestly your version is extremely compelling it's hard to see it's hard to see a downside in that because you're taking on additional risk and putting and essentially putting your money where your mouth is. It would be nice if your structure didn't depend on a, even that marginal amount of philanthropy to get to the right the right number. Correct. It would be nice. And over time, I mean, who knows if we can sustain the philanthropy? Who knows which of these pieces, you know, will will come under strain. You know what it requires? What's that? Is it requires that once we get to that point where we have the 5% of teachers getting paid 150 to 200 grand, you have a kind of, you know, a kind of kicker in your ISA where anyone who hits that has to give you a a nice healthy chunk of that as a, as a little thank you. And then that, that becomes your philanthropy. Yeah. Oh, totally. People worry about, of course, every type of motivation that deals with money for good reason. It sometimes like makes people into total assholes, but If there was such a thing as the $200,000 teacher, then the way I would be interested in editing our value proposition is, hey, wouldn't it be awesome if that were true, then it would be super fun to try to create the training program that specialized like Navy SEALs in saying, we're going to do everything we can 
to build your skills up so much that you're helping kids so much or succeeding at such a great level that you'll be one of these $200,000 a year teachers. Uh, that would be great. That would be. It's going to be hard. Like it's hard to get selected and you have the equivalent of the week on the frozen beach without sleep like those seals have where like yeah. people are getting knocked out of training left and right. But it really gets a group of unusually skilled people that are highly adaptable and that would be so fun to work on as a project right where not everybody has to try to do that and not everybody has to say i'm so committed i really want to be like all in on teaching yeah but it'd be fun for the cohort of people that did that they would have a place to go yeah that would be awesome. I like that. So all we need to do is start getting some teachers paid crazy amounts of money. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you, Arvind. Great show. 